Hello everyone and again, welcome again to this uh, new ITRU which is International Training and Research in Urooncology and Endourology webinar and this webinar really is to simplify and have almost like a beginner's guide to publishing scientific papers. We are very proud to have this association with Frontiers in Surgery and we are thankful to our sponsors for uh, making this possible. That includes Sun Pharma and Medisage. I've got a star-studded lineup of uh, speakers from four different uh, countries, including India, uh, UK, Norway. Uh, and uh, it looks like to me that once you have attended this, you should be able to at least formulate the ideas and take the ideas from conception to delivery. And you should be able to have some tips and tricks, if you like, for medical publishing. If you have any questions or queries, please put in the chat box and we'll try and answer them. But the important thing is to understand how to simplify it, how to make it easier to understand both for yourself and when you are submitting it for the publishers to accept it. So I've got with me my good friend, uh, a fellow colleague uh, who's working in Newcastle as a robotic surgeon, Bhavan Rai. Bhavan is very well published and uh, known in the academic circles. And uh, with us, we also have Dr. Arbin Panda, who is uh, uh, working in Sikandrabad in India, Aditya Sharma from uh, PGI Chandigarh, Arjun, who is also in Newcastle, Patrick Jones from Norway, and we will be joined by Dr. Pietro Paolo from Southampton, and we have got some pre-recorded talks from uh, a few speakers. So without uh, any further delay, I would like to thank uh, all the audience participation, all the speakers, and Arbin, over to you for the first talk. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to share my screen. Thank you for the opportunity, first of all. Uh, it's, uh, it's quite an honor to be here. So I'll just go to that my first talk. Let's go to that. Okay. Okay. So uh, I'll be talking on why write an article. Now, this, this, is, this can obvious, even be an oxymoron, why write an article? Uh, the, the reason, of course, uh, uh, as uh, Cervantes said many centuries back, the pen is the tongue of the mind. If you are, if you are thinking something and if, if you want somebody else to know about it, uh, of course, speech, yes, as, as Huxley said, but more by writing, man has been able to put something of himself beyond death. And we are all mortal. Uh, for example, if you if you take the the Chinese traveler Hyun Sang who came to India and uh, he came to India to be instructed in in uh, Buddhism, but he preserved the records of the political and social aspects of the land he visited, and he is, he is now almost immortal. When you when you look at you when you want to know about the uh, about those times and what happened, and you just turn to his writings. Secondly, if you look uh, and and in Europe, you if you take the example of of Marco Polo, it was his writings that inspired the first world map and then of course, generation of explorers. And uh, if you look at the earliest textbook of surgery, it was probably written something uh, sometimes around 1600 before Christ. And uh, we really don't know who the author was. It is uh, called now as the Edwin Smith Papyrus uh, after this uh, is discoverer, but, but it remains while well, the author himself is, is long gone. Uh, similarly, if you look at the third or fourth century AD, um, AD the, the Shushruta Samhita was published. We really, really do not know who, who, who Shushruta was, but we do have his writings and we do have his uh, surgical techniques, some of which are in use even today. So why should we write? Uh, we should write to share ideas, to report research, gain intellectual stimulation, express an opinion, uh, generate discussion, and of course, advance one's discipline. And again, if we, if, we, if we break it down, we write to assert ownership of a topic um, for promotion, of course, publish or perish. Sometimes you have a rare case, a very instructive case, you want to report that case. And of course, we come to the thing, we enhance personal reputation with writing and, and achieve a small measure of immortality, like you own a new idea. And, and finally, if you do write a blockbuster, you have financial gain. So, but why, but that's okay, that's why we write, but what is the reason for not writing? Now, the reason for not writing would be the usual things like not enough time. I have nothing to write about. 
a lack of knowledge on how to research information. And, and then one very important thing, uh, we have no mentors, so we don't know how to write. So uh, again, when that happens, when you're young and sometimes there can be no self-confidence, I'm not confident enough to write, I don't know how to start, I hate writing, and sometimes a lack of secretarial support. So, so when I plan to write, when you plan to write, well, so you need to think of a few questions first. And one of them is, what do I need to stress if I'm gonna write? And what would be my message? And what I would like to do, do next if I, when I do plan to write? So, so the key, key questions we have to consider is what do I have to say? So is the paper worth writing? Uh, this is very important because uh, you, this so-called so, so what factor. If there are so many papers of the same type, more, people may not read your paper or even your book may not be accepted by a publisher. Are you trying to change concepts? Or are you trying to change practice? Are you stimulating a discussion on the subject? Or will your writing have an impact on undergraduate or postgraduate curriculum? So you need to, of course, consider has such a paper been already published? And secondly, you need to consider after you have written this paper, which audience would benefit more from this work? You have to select the correct journal. There is no point in publishing a, a, a surgical topic on, in an anesthesiology journal. So when you start writing, you think about the target journals early on. Is it indexed? What is the impact factor? Now, impact is not always a six letter word. You need to know impact factor is important, but you need to know about other, other, other methods of metrics. And there are also other social metrics that can be equally important as the impact factor. And you decide well. So there are two ways to decide. One is the aim high. You go for the, for the, for the most highest rated journal. And in which case you have to allow for turnaround time and you know the you know, you have a second album syndrome. So you have success later. Or you go for a low you know, uh, journals of low importance, but then if you get accepted, you can't really can't subsequently move up on the food chain. Whatever you do, whichever journal you accept, please remember that you obey instructions to authors. That's most important. So index versus non-index journals, uh, that's another topic, but index journals allow your articles to be found in a database. So you have greater chance of being cited. Your if it's a good paper, it's a good study. Uh, you will be you will be more known because you because it will it will show up in all the searches. And non-index journals, however, are more likely to accept your manuscripts. And these non-index journals, if it's a good journal, just starting out, it may become indexed in the future. Non-index uh, journals with open access policy sometimes has greater visibility than even an in index journal. It's controversial, but generally, if you are choosing a journal which may become indexed in the future and is open access, uh, then it may be worth having a look there. Again, after you've written the paper, sometimes you think of yeah, my paper may get rejected, but why should that be rejected? The most common reasons for rejections are the material is not relevant, the format is not appropriate, similar publishers are available, so there's no new message. Poor English. Now, this is something which is important in people who are writing and are non you know, native speakers of English. They may not have the, uh, the knowledge of English uh, to be able to compose the manuscript well. But I can say from my experience as, as associate editor that poor English is rarely the only cause for rejection of an article. Again, more importantly, this may be insufficient problem or a hypothesis statement, that's, that's sometimes important. Again, this is very important. Inaccuracy or inconsistency of data, that, that uh, sets the mind to work. Why is the data like this? Can I believe this data? There may be insufficient data, inappropriate statistics, and over interpretation of results sometimes and failure to follow instructions for authors. So when we come to writing as something I want to talk to everyone about who starts writing and when you start writing and you start planning a study, something very important called scientific integrity. Sometimes it is, it is very, uh, very um, uh, tempting to you know, slightly modify the, uh, the, the, um, the results. So it's important to have scientific integrity because ultimately, ultimately, uh, an article may or may not get published, but in but in the future, the integrity is going to matter on the on how you are being looked up upon by your colleagues. So, as as Feynman said, it's a principle of science that corresponds to kind of utter honesty, kind of leading over backwards. So, example, if you're doing an experiment, you should report everything that you think may make it invalid, not only what you think that is right. So. 
Uh, again, uh, when you start writing, it's important to avoid scientific fraud, no data manipulation, no falsification, no duplicate manuscripts, avoid redundant publication. The journalism is important, both print electronic of ideas, of, uh, of, of language, and never fail to disclose authors' conflicts of interest. So, uh, so the, finally, I like to say the skill of writing, when you have the skill of writing, is basically to create a context in which other people can think and other people can, you know, and, and develop their own ideas. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, I will go to the next talk now by Aditya Sharma. Thanks. Um, I'll just share my slides, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everyone here in India, and good morning to everyone there in UK. Uh, I'm Dr. Aditya. I'm assistant professor at PGI Chandigarh, and I'll be discussing, discussing a very intriguing and inter interesting topic, that is manuscript writing, what not to write. So as we begin our journey uh, in scientific writing, uh, as an author, we always try to learn what to write. So how do you learn what not to write? Once you start reviewing paper, once you become associate or assistant editors, that is the time period when you learn. It's, it's like in surgery, we say that initial 10 years, you are just learning how to operate, what when to operate. But only in the last decade of your life, uh, operating uh, career, you understand when not to operate. So similarly, in a later part of your career, you learn what not to write. So I'll be trying to do justice to this topic. And as, as they say that writing is easy, all you do, is to stare at the blank sheet of paper until drops of blood form on your forehead. So that, this is all it takes to convert your ideas into words. So there's not much of literature. Everybody will be telling you what to write, what to write, how to write, and nobody will be telling you what not to write in a paper. So I came across this very interesting paper and it tells you how to write consistently boring scientific literature. And if you're going to do these 10 points in your study, Definitely, it's not going to get published. So if you are avoiding focus, avoiding originality and your personality, you are writing long contribution at the end of each sentence, you are removing implication and speculations, you are taking basically the essence out of your publication or your uh, work which you have done, you are leaving out illustration and just writing and writing. These are the points which will take your publication into the garbage. bin. You are omitting necessary steps of reasoning, using many abbreviations and terms, making it very difficult to interpret. You are suppressing humor and flowery language. That is a little uh, controversial thing because I think still think that scientific writing has to be uh, a little away from the humor, but still it works. Uh, you are degrading biology to statistics and you are quoting numerous papers for previous statements. So these are the 10, top 10 list of recommendations for writing a consistently boring publication. And I'll be discussing a little bit in detail. First point, let's talk about focus. This is the most uh, cited or most uh, uh, quoted thing when we come to an introduction. And this is a Watson Crick paper on the DNA model. And this was the introduction on single line they introduced that we wish to suggest a structure for the salt of DNA. The structure has novel features which are of considerable biological interest. That is all the introduction had to, had to say. Of course, in uh, 2021, it will be difficult to hear that you are introducing your topic like this, but still you want to be focused and precise, as precise as possible in your introduction. Whenever you are citing literature, do not cite an excessive number of articles at the end of the sentences in your introduction to support a minor point. This is because you are just throwing a bundle of articles in the air and after they have hit the ground, you are arti uh, asking your reader that you find something relevant amongst these resulting uh, mess. So it does not at all interest the reader to find more information and you should demonstrate your understanding of the literature by simply citing one or two articles which illustrate your argument well and you should guide the reader to them. Again, you should follow timeline precisely. Do not provide a literature review that was done a decade or a two decade ago until and unless it is very much relevant, especially when you are writing a review article. It shows that you are failing to keep abreast with the literature, which is uh, recent in your field. And a manuscript that fails to cite the recently published articles is unlikely to be representing a novel work. So stay, stay away from citing articles which are very old until and unless they are very, very essential to your publication. This is a, one of the red flags that you do not plagiarize. Do not cut and paste into your manuscript anything from the published literature which you find on the internet. It will ruin your reputation and it is viewed unfavorably by the editors as well as the reviewers 
So copying test uh, text uh, is a form of plagiarism and usually leads to your manuscript being rejected without being sent to the peer review process. This is a very, very uh, important aspect which I want to highlight that a lot of uh, initial publishers or initial uh, researchers go into, they, they slice the salam. They almost kind of duplicate, but like they can differ in the reagent isotope or some other variable. And in our part, they can just uh, go into the micro uh, stats of that and they uh, 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 suppose they are uh, publishing the results from an investigation which will be divided into the least publishable unit and spread thinly across several manuscripts while one would suffice. So if your if your single publication will be sufficing your work, do not do not publish. Try to publish in one or in a couple or three papers. Coming to the acronyms, it's a very very uh, commonly done uh, mistake, and uh, it's very not at all easy to remember. Very difficult to read, especially by if you, if the it is being read by uh, people from different speciality. For example, I have come across. Uh, this uh, sentence, SPE avoidance is assumed by FAA to occur with SWP alerts. It's, it's pretty much a jargon to me and somebody is like rapping uh, into my face. So try to construct the sentence so that the repeating acronyms is not required and write comprehensible sentences rather than sentences full of jargon. You must optimize technical terms so that the article is appealing, readable to other speciality as well. And remember that innovations occur at the junction of two specialities. This I always tell to my residents that you can interact with uh, people of other specialities and you are going to have more of in innovations and inventions at the junction. Re regarding the use of colloquial expressions, do not use chatty, conversational or a colloquial expressions when your intention is to be precise. Do not assume that your reader shares your understanding of such expression and if your writing is ambiguous, the reader is simply left to guessing what your uh, meaning is. Well, while it is appropriate while you're writing essays, poetry and prose, it doesn't go with the scientific publication. Coming to the results, whenever you are representing your data, and this is one of the recent theses which I, I was editing, um, immediately it uh, takes back, uh, takes off the reviewer when he is reviewing and you are uh, writing your data, representing them up to four to five places. So limit it to two and keep it uniform all across. If you are using one decimal basis, keep it to one. If you are using up to two, keep it to two. Again, from the similar table, I am just showing regarding the statuses, as already Dr. Arbind has mentioned, that you need to stick to the basics. Parametric, non-parametric, it's, it's like the bread and butter for a reviewer when they are reviewing. If, if I am looking at this data and the mean is, the standard deviation is more than the mean, I know that it's a skewed distribution and you're wasting my time representing it, uh, the data as mean and SD. So median with a range or median with IQR is what you need to represent here. So stick to the basic, the statistics has to be presented in a certain way, you need to do that. Do not leave things to imagination. Do not leave it to the reader to identify the major results from your data tables. You have done a work. Not every data is important. You need to uh, separate the wheat from the chaff and state clearly the major results that form the basis of the work being reported. Illustrations and imaging, they are a very integral part when you want to convey something. Uh, this was the article I just wanted to highlight. This uh, came after uh, from the reviewer without any comment and was accepted for publication in a single thing. So this was the image which highlighted that urethral duplication, duplication with the clitoral voiding was a rare presentation. And we threw a diagram or end illustration showed what exactly is happening and what we are trying to convey uh, with along with the image. So illustration, a very important component whenever you are doing a scientific pu publication. Coming to the discussion, do not fail to discuss in the discussion section the results that are presented in the results. And do not beat about the bush uh, discussing results from other studies rather than discussing your results first. Tie the literature to your results and present the data in a co cohesive form. You, this is the discussion which will convince the editor and the reviewer that you have something of consequence to report, what is significance is and what applicability it has. So the discussion has to be very, very robust in terms of conveying the meaning. Last but not the least, that language, grammar, and syntax, uh, Dr. Arbind has already laid importance on it, that it is not the only criteria which a reviewer or editor looks at your, uh, when, when they are rejecting, but still they pisses off the editor or a reviewer whenever you are uh, committing a spelling error. It shows that you were not uh, probably uh, serious about uh, this publication and you have not put so much effort into it. People who have difficulty in uh, communicating with English language can obviously they can seek help from other colleagues and that is very important part of an internal review committee preview, uh, review committee that you have uh, with your co-authors and also you cannot have a, a single person coming without a, uh, the publication. 
So take home message is that you have to be precise. Your, uh, your manuscript has to be attractive, factually correct. It has to be comprehensible, informative, and effective. Follow the I, I am rats. And uh, whatever you may do, you have to go through a uh, burnt off uh, peer review. And uh, uh, the general you need to identify that will be discussed uh, in detail later. Happy writing. And if you are happy while you are writing, I am pretty sure that editor and reviewer will be happy while they are reading your journal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aditya. Uh, that was a very nice uh, of what or not to do. Uh, the next speaker is from Norway, good friend of uh, ours, Patrick Jones, who has uh, published uh, plenty of papers. And although he's still early in his training, his CV is uh, full of lots of different ideas and papers. So Paddy, over to you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, speak today and be part of the uh, iTrue journey. I'm going to talk today about targeting your journals and the audience. This isn't a topic for which there's any Cochrane reviews, sadly, or any randomized control trials. This really is my own mistakes, lessons and experiences. And because it's such a big topic, what I've done is I've broken it down into what I feel to be the 10 key areas, just to make it more digestible for you. To start with, the why is this important? Well, many will say that submitting a paper is kind of like landing a plane. You've gone 99% of your journey. You're nearly there. You've traveled all where you need to go. You're at that last bit, which arguably is the most difficult and where you can have mistakes. So for me, I think about if you plan in advance, if you bear some of these things in mind, which I'm going to talk about, then you can help to have a smooth landing. Beginning at number one, I have Journal Index, which Professor Pan has already mentioned. And you start to get an idea that often many of us will see, speak about the same things as you see what's important. Now, there are many catalogues, bibliographic archives that are out there, but the, the one I would say we need to all focus for, if we can, is PubMed. Now, there are several journals out there, for example, in neurology, which are very good, which aren't indexed in PubMed, but it does pay to be indexed in PubMed. And that is because of visibility, so your work is more likely to be found, rather than being in the depths of this grey literature, which you see these other databases often are. And then with more visibility, you will gain more citations. Also, a point later, perhaps in one's career, is that there are certain grants or jobs, positions, that will ask for your work that has been uh, in PubMed. So later down the line, it does pay. At number two, I put being wary of predatory journal. Now, this is something which we all come to face, and they very much are like wolves in sheep's clothing. These are just two examples of emails I have, and I'm sure everyone has received it as well. And often it seems just a bit too good to be true, and it is too good to be true. They will claim to uh, process your work very quickly, maybe reduce fee. They will claim to have very high visibility. But in reality, they don't. And there are some very good articles which I'd bring your attention to out there, which will just give a good guide to what they are. So really my tip this is, if it seems to be good to be true, it probably is, my mother always says, but also check with your senior author if there's any doubt. Number three, will then ask me, well, how do I know if it's a real journal? Well, luckily within the domain of urology, a few years ago, a group of uh, experts in the field came up with this. This is a snapshot from the website. It's called the Urology Green List. And uh, it gives you uh, a list of trustworthy journals which you can do. Now, another tip for this is if there's any doubt, again, check with your senior author. Next is the impact factor, which is again be mentioned by one of the uh, other speakers. And I won't go over what he said, but to add to that, it's a metric which is used, and it's based over a two-year period, really, of uh, the number of articles which are cited based on the number of articles which that journal has produced. And it comes out with a, a number, and it's produced by Clarabay Analytics. And you can look on their website, and you'll have these long lists of uh, journals. In fact, it was created in the 1950s, and I understand originally it was used by libraries to try and order or see which, which journals they should have in their selection. Then in about the 70s, it became used in the format which we understand today. And now it's used often as a surrogate market for importance. And as my colleague has said already, if you do manage to achieve your article in a high impact journal, then the chance of being cited more highly is greater. So in high, also, you do have to be realistic. 
Next is open access, and you will see this orange padlock sign, which is synonymous with it. It's a very big topic, and it's one which creates discussion and debate. This is a, a screenshot of a actually very good YouTube video you can watch, which explains it in a comment format, which is only a few minutes long, and it describes its journey. But really, you have now these journals which are open access, which are therefore free. Now, someone has to pay, uh, and the payment come in different form, whether you go over that privately, your institution, or for example, if you're part of a research fund. So on the right side of the screen, what I place is, earlier on, it's good to be aware of your options. Because for example, there are some countries where those institutions will have a deal whereby they will pay for it, or there will be a reduced rate. So it's worth seeing early before you start, whether or not where you work has uh, that kind of association. Because it is known that if you do publish an open access journal, and I do think open access is the way of what the future will be, that the citation count will be higher. Next, before you start, I have a simple checklist in my mind as to who's actually going to read this, because it does make a difference, as well as it makes a difference for the reviewers and their style of reviewing, I think. So I, firstly, you have to decide is it basic science or is it clinical? Are you writing for a multidisciplinary journal or is it a speciality, a broad one, such as Indian Urology, such as Turkish Urology or Gold Urology, or is it very much a subspeciality journal, such as the Journal of Urology? Are you writing for surgeons or physicians? I know from my experience that the reviewer style of both is quite different. And next, I would say look whether you're going to be writing to students or a postgraduate or for people who are really experts in their field. Next, number seven is really knowing what's out there. So for example, there are articles out there which will talk about uh, how you go about doing things. There's a very good series actually in Journal of Clinical Urology. It's titled with the Clinical Research Toolkit. Myself and Marvin, we can do one paper to it. And it will just give you in an easy to read format tips and tricks on how you do these things. And you can look at it in your own time. Another one is actually if you go to conferences, or their presentations, many of these will be done by journal editors, as well as their courses on how to publish. This is just one example which you can find out there, a very good one by Jim Catter, who's now gone to be the editor of European Neurology. And that shows you the other side perspective on what they're looking for. Another one is, in regards to knowing what's out there, is about, if you are a resident, well, there are some sections of journals where you can publish. Uh, you have to provide a, confirmation letter from a uh, senior author or the head of your institution. This just being one in Turkish urology, but there are many out there which also do the same. Another one is, which is very good as being part of a research collaborative. First, it's a very well-known one, and on their website, they have a list of opportunities, and a screenshot of there. Another one, which is uh, Young and Urology, as you can see, uh, the picture on the right, and we're lucky that we have the nicest boss of all the, uh, the groups out there, which is Amelia. But that's another one which you should consider Joining. Number eight, I think about, think about you are the reviewer. So when I look at the papers which come, it's amazing how much first impressions count, whether or not you have done many of the things which my colleagues before have said, the formatting, simple spelling mistakes. Um, number two is, and this is probably the most important one, is what is the USP? What is the unique selling point and why your paper stands out? There are many articles on certain topics where there's an abundance of it. So you want to try and show the reviewers, the editor, and ultimately the reader what makes yours different. Next is clear methodology, because this is often what trips up many people um, in their papers. And finally, really, one which uh, I've come to realize more and more is that figures shouldn't really be an afterthought. It's very easy as a resident, a junior, starting out, you spend all these hours on a paper and you think, I need to make a Bigger. But actually, for a reader and editor's perspective, they'll look at this and many people, it may be the only thing they really look at in a paper when they first open it up. And to give an example of how it's changing, we recently made uh, one, or I think it was a sketch pilot that made this, um, to give you an idea of how things are changing. The era of infographics are happening, and rather than a standard table, you can start to make it more attractive so that people see it. So this is one that we made, and it shows you how things are changing. Number nine, I put momentum. Now, uh, fortunate, and what others have said, is to have a mentor. Uh, and uh, I think that's going to be a key message for today. But uh, Professor Samani 
told me this long ago, and I also I always have it in my the back of my mind, and that is if you have an idea, someone probably else does as well. So it's good to keep to a timeline, uh, set a timeline, which you will stick to, especially when you start, just have one project at a time. You need to learn to say no, but at the same time, understand that it's okay to say no. Also, when you're organizing your time, not just for this, but life in surgery, you do see this slide quite often, but I do think it is very good, and that is the Eisenhower decision matrix about how you split things up in terms of being important and urgent, whereas at the other end, things that are not urgent, not important, which you don't need to do in your life. And number 10, and it might make people smile, but I think there's a serious point to it, and that is when it comes to publishing, uh, when submitting your journals, just as Denzel Washington says, if you hang around long enough, you will get that haircut. If you get a rejection, it doesn't work out, just like if you don't get the job that you want. I think it's important to keep at it and, and not leave. So thank you very much. Uh, it's been a real privilege to be here today. Thanks, Paddy. That was a good journey. And I like the landing. You know, you have to, you've done everything, but if you don't, if you crash land, it doesn't help. So absolutely, th thank you for that. Uh, the next two presentations are pre-recorded, pre -recorded, so can I ask uh, uh, Ranjit and the team to play Chris Harding's or Rob, Rob's first and then Chris Harding's, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Rob Garrity. I'm an academic clinical fellow in Newcastle in the UK. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't uh, be at this excellent set of talks in person, um, but this talk is going to be about referencing and statistics, hopefully made easy. So I'll quickly go through the referencing side of things before spending a bit more time on the statistics uh, as it's a bit more complex. So for referencing, having good reference management software is key. There are multiple different options, but look for software that gives you a database and enables you to cite whilst you write. The database will allow you to build a bank of references that you can cite in multiple papers over and over again. Um, Two good options are EndNote and Papers. So I personally use Papers as it has a word plugin and an easy to use database. So I'm often asked where to look for papers. So I would suggest to look for narrative reviews by recognized experts. So in this particular example, this was a narrative review we published in 2019. Um, so in most narrative reviews, key references are highlighted. So in this case, with a bullet point and a short sentence on why it is a key paper. Uh, so that's all I'm going to say on referencing, so we have a little more to time on statistics. So I'm often asked which test to do in a particular scenario, and the answer, rather frustratingly, is it depends on the data. So we need to decide what sort of data you've got, whether that be nominal, ordinal, continuous or survival time, if it's continuous data, then we further subdivide into normal and non-normal. This is also known as parametric or non-parametric. So you should generate a histogram to explore normality. There are also tests for normality, but which I won't talk about today. So I've generated two examples for you from the Newcastle Stones database. On the left is a normally distributed histogram of serum potassium concentration and on the right is a non-normally distributed histogram of serum CRP concentration. The potassium graph has the bell-shaped curve you would expect with the apex of the fitted normal curve and the highest frequency bar roughly matching. Um, with the CRP histogram, that is not the case and is therefore, broadly speaking, non-normally distributed. Once you have selected what data you have, it's then time to select the test. So this is the test selection matrix and is key for test selection. I'll make this available to everyone so you can use it at home, but it should be relatively self-explanatory. Um, and I'll talk about how to perform these tests later on in this talk. Some people can be confused as to exactly what a p-value is. The p in p-value stands for probability. With the probability, being the probability of the null hypothesis being true. So an example null hypothesis would be that there is no difference between two particular treatment outcomes, uh, for one particular outcome. With a p-value of less than 0.05, we are saying that there is a less than one in 20 chance of the null hypothesis being true. 
and, and this is the usual threshold for accepting the alternative hypothesis. In other words, there is a difference between the two hypothetical treatments for our hypothetical outcome. Statistical error is common and is often not discussed in papers. There are two types, one and two. One, or a false positive, is due to chance. If you do 20 tests, statistically, at least one will be significant, regardless of whether it is true or not. This is why we correct for multiple testing. Two, or a false negative, is due to a study being underpowered to detect a difference between two comparators. To counteract this, we perform sample size calculations. Statistical software is far more variable than referencing software. It can be really quite expensive, but usually with expense you get more user friendliness. So for basic tests for most papers, SPSS is absolutely fine. Uh, it's easy to use and will give you all the output you need. The major downside is the cost, as, as you can see. Although I believe there is a free uh, month trial to see if you get on with the, uh, with the software. R and its expansion R Studio are good for more complex statistics and data exploration. And even more importantly, they're free. Uh, they can perform all the latest machine learning tests, such as neural networks and random forest regression. However, the downside is that all the inputs are, need to be in code. There are some excellent YouTube tutorials on how to perform specific tests, and there's a very active community that can help you with basic coding in R. Unfortunately, it's beyond the scope of the, this talk to uh, talk you through how to use R. So once you've selected your test and decided on your software, a major step between you and the result is data cleansing. So this takes the majority of the time needed to perform a particular set of analyses. Each software wants data framed in a particular way. And because of this, data cleansing is often where people become stuck when trying to perform a particular test. My advice is to try and code your data set before you start, especially if you're using SPSS. So SPSS likes everything to be coded as numbers, whilst R you can use words. Obviously, these have to be the same. So in other words, yes or no. So as mentioned in the previous slide, there are numerous YouTube tutorials on setting up a data set uh, for use in a particular program for a particular test. So I would just type it into Google and it should come up. So in conclusion, software is king for both referencing and statistics. Look out for narrative review articles that will highlight key papers in the area you are looking for. I will make sure the statistical test selection matrix is available as this is an invaluable resource for test selection. Be wary of statistical error and get used to Hello everyone, my name is Chris Harding. I'm a consultant urologist in Newcastle. Uh, Rod Stock has just finished, and the back team. Uh, can we start Chris Harding Stock now, which is next? Uh, that was a quite an informative talk uh, regarding statistics and referencing, and I think these are key areas that uh, you have to remember, because without uh, at least some simple statistics, it is really difficult to publish. And referencing must be up to date, and. Uh, uh, relevant to what your talk is and avoiding too much jargon. Uh, so I think to publish a paper is like, you know, learning to ride a bike and then excelling it. And the better data you have, the better the context is, the better the layout is, uh, the, the better your end product or your paper will be, and the more chances of it getting accepted in a, a good journal. So I think, uh, I'm not sure if the back, back end, are we having any trouble with loading uh, Chris Harding's presentation? Yes, I just heard. Uh, if, if we want to, we can go with the next one, but I'll wait for you. So again, I think I, I have written close to over 400 papers now. And I think the first thing to do is 
Uh, it becomes easier when you're starting. It is always slightly more difficult. The context is difficult. Spend some time because there is no shortcut to writing a paper. Anyone who has published will tell you. Doing an abstract for a meeting is a lot easier than writing a paper because it is peer reviewed more thoroughly. And you, you might have to have one, two, three, four revisions before you get up to you know, a reasonable level. And don't feel shy, you have to put in the time. The other common mistake I think, which I, I should mention here, I'm not sure if any of my colleagues will, will cover. Make sure the cover letter is relevant. Make sure when you're doing a cover letter, when you're submitting it, the submission process is followed because it's very easy to not follow the submission process and then fall down by the wayside because of that simple mistake. So these are very important things beyond the scope of what you've written that you must follow. Oh, hello, uh, sir. Can I share please so video? Yes, please. Yep. If you can share the video. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Chris Harding. I'm a consultant urologist in Newcastle, and I'd like to thank the committee for asking me to speak about responding to reviewers' comments once a manuscript has been reviewed. Here are my disclosures. There are some general points to address on the topic of responding to reviewers. The first one we need to realize is that accepting without any revision is very, very rare indeed. There is almost always a requirement to revise the manuscript. So you must take any request for revision as being the norm. The usual way I approach it is to have a look at all of the reviewers' comments and then I tend to sleep on it as it always kind of makes you cross when you read the reviewers comments as of course you think you've submitted the perfect manuscript but it's good to go away sleep on it and come back to the more widespread process of revision a bit later on it's good to have an attitude that this is a scientific debate between yourself and the reviewers but you don't need to take a polarized viewpoint and you shouldn't overly defend your paper as that will only annoy the reviewers and you have to remember that it's those reviewers that will still have to decide whether or not your review is suitable for acceptance and subsequent publication. It's absolutely routine to be asked for clarification regarding several different aspects of any manuscript. The research question is often queried and you need to be able to state that explicitly. You may be asked for further explanation with regards to what's already in the text or the reviewers may ask you to insert additional text to fill a gap in the paper. It's quite common to be asked further methodological questions and a strengthening of the methods section is almost always required for for any reviews and within that may come an expansion of the results section as well with additional analyses being requested by one or more reviewers um, there are all most always points or additional points to be made in the discussion section and again, this is something that's encountered quite regularly when your papers are reviewed. I think the take home messages from most papers are one, the overall results, two, the limitations of your study, and three, what your study adds to the current body of research and how it points us in the right direction in terms of further research in the future. So don't be too put out if you are asked for clarification on these matters that you can see on the, this slide. I would advise in terms of practical um, advice that you should respond to each reviewer individually. You should address all points that have been made, even if the same point is made by multiple reviewers. Don't just put C answer above, reinstate, re, re um, enforce your reply and make sure that you do each review the courtesy of an individual reply to each point. 
it can get difficult if the reviewer is, in your opinion, wrong. If that is the case, then you should be polite. You don't want to start a battle. So rather than pointing out the um, the, the failings of the reviewer, you might want to just take this one on the chin and say something like, we're sorry that this point did not come across in the original manuscript, but to clarify, and that's something that I think is really useful. You don't want to be adversarial with reviewers because after all, the decision on your paper remains in their hands. You should remember that reviewers don't get paid to do this, this job. They do it in their own time and they're giving their time for free. And therefore, you should thank them regularly throughout your response to the reviewers. You should also be mindful that if you fall out with a set of reviewers from one journal and decide to submit your manuscript elsewhere, it is entirely possible that the same reviewers will be approached and will have to carry out a review of your manuscript. So do bear that in mind, particularly if your manuscript hasn't changed from the initial submission. So just a word of advice that if you do get reviewers comments and you are advised to make corrections that's probably the the right direction to go in so in summary i think we can say that you should thank reviewers you should be polite at all times and you should address every comment that is made be very thorough in your response because this is the make or break point in terms of publication of your paper you should not get mad Everyone feels a little irritated when they read their original review because, of course, they think they have submitted the perfect manuscript, which doesn't exist, by the way. But don't get mad. Have a look. And if it does make you a bit angry, close the email, come back to it another day. Don't be adversarial. This is not a battle between you and the reviewers. They're trying to work with you to make your paper better and make it nearer to the threshold for publications. And following on from that, you mustn't derive any points made by the reviewers because that will just put their backs up and make it more likely that you have an adverse outcome. So I hope that summary has been useful. And with regards to your responses to reviewers i think they are the kind of main points that i always follow but the, the you know if i was to pick out one thing it would be be grateful and be polite thank you very much for listening thank you chris that was an excellent presentation uh, our next speaker is amelia pietro paolo uh, amelia is a budding star She's currently the chairman of YAU subsection of endourology. She's an endourologist in her own right. Uh, she has uh, published a number of uh, collaborative research projects. And I think this is an important area, especially in conditions that are relatively rare. And also the COVID has taught us one thing that we need answers quick and we need it in big volumes. And in, in times like this, it, it, there are challenges and Amelia will uh, take us through what the challenges are and the potential solutions around it. Amelia, thank you. Thank you very much. I will try to answer your <laughs> questions. So I'm gonna share my screen. And first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very pleased and honored to be in this High True webinar. And um, I'm gonna to discuss today about the difficult topic of working with national and international collaborators and let this translate in multicentric studies and research career. So I hope you can see my screen. I have no conflict of interest and my name is Amelia Petropaolo. I work in Southampton University Hospital. So how to start? Uh, first of all, uh, it's the best thing would be to work in a place where there is an active academic working environment. And why? Because clearly this is full of ideas for new projects and there's a good teamwork and there's a, a, a good case loads that can allow you to use data for data collection. However, never remember that the patient safety comes first. And in fact, sharing patient data needs to be done honestly and respecting always patient confidentiality. 
And how to start was the first step. So first of all, identifying local and national needs or gaps. And that's what we normally do in our uh, center. Um, we thought what could be a need in our local uh, reality. And we found that actually cost is always one of the priority together with the patient safety. And so we analyzed the micro cost in comparing disposable with um, reusable cystoscopes, uh, flexible cystoscopes. And also we've analyzed our results in terms of outcomes, but also cost savings for um, virtual stone clinic. Now, mainly during COVID times, we found that there is a great benefit to turn virtually. Equally, we need to put first our outcomes and in terms of patient uh, outcomes, of course. And we've analyzed other, our database, finding that uh, having a, a quicker operating time could uh, benefit our patient in terms of outcomes. And also we have finally solved the uh, endless controversy of ureteric cluster sheets, yes or no, because everybody has his own idea about that. And in our case series, we found that this is actually very useful and improves our outcomes. Always to improve uh, patient outcomes, we've um, tried to reduce our hospital stay and uh, which creates also more beds for acute emergencies, but also decrease um, the costs. And we found that not using apnea during ureteroscopies could guarantee better outcomes for the patient without chest complication, but also uh, the patient didn't need to stay overnight and we had a higher rate of day cases. Uh, similarly, we wanted to reduce our complication rates in mainly ureteroscopies after uh, sepsis after ureteroscopies. And we realized that not every patient came initially with sepsis and infected obstructed kidney uh, was supposed to have sepsis again after elective ureteroscopy. And so our outcomes have been improving over the time. Always try to choose the best technique, and we are doing some trials to find the best laser, comparing the low power with the mid power uh, laser that we recently published. And um, thanks to that, we started using pop dusting to um, have better stone free rate and better outcomes. Of course, nationally, it's very important to collaborate, and um, that's always difficult to do, but there are common uh, things that is possible to solve together. And this is, for example, the first uh, questionnaire that has been done evaluating the measure outcomes of kidney stone patients, and it's been done by Dr. Joshi from Cardiff, the same one who created the stent uh, symptoms questionnaire, USSSQ and we collaborated in, with our patients. And um, this more recently is um, the, the gender trends for urology in the UK, where we found that there was a big gap of females in the urology professions. And this gap is actually still existing, probably being filled a bit in the last years with more female approaching urology, but there's a, still a, a large difference. Team effort, I think, is paramount to, to find a team that supports and also gives um, uh, the, the daily support to have good outcomes and look after the patients, which is the base of our database, of course. And um, to go do the networking and to try to um, start a research work, it's very important to network with other centers. And there are many opportunities for networking. For example, locally or nationally, there are fellowships, but also different opportunities like conferences, workshops, or courses, short visits in other hospitals, uh, webinars like the one we're having, and uh, local thematic meetings that now are restarting, thankfully. When we go to the international world, that's a plenty of opportunities. Every and each of, of them, they can widen your uh, mind and give an opportunity for networking with other centers and start a research career. And for example, uh, there are ex exchange inter international programs or scholarship offered by EAU together with courses and master classes for trainees. 
and international conferences are also very, very good to, um, to interact with colleagues and share ideas face-to-face, -face, of course, is ideal because there are better connections and also to share, chess, share success with other colleagues. Hands on training uh, is another example of knowing other people of the same level, but also gaining in, insight from trainers and networking to build some research uh, together with other centers. And that's an example of our map of co collaboration of Southampton Institution. Um, we have collaborated for it with at least 25 countries worldwide. Of course, here you can not see the US uh, uh, American continent, but that's just behind. And um, everybody collaborated in uh, papers and multi, multi-centric studies. And in fact, the result of this, connect, of this connections and mutual um, agreements and helps, you can see in these uh, papers. And this paper is about global variation of uh, bottled water, and this compares 22 countries, for example. Also, this has been just developed as an ATLAS scoring system with all the nomograms in the urology done uh, with, uh, together with the Canadian urology team and Norway with Dr. Johns. Recently, we've also um, tried to get more uh, knowledge about pediatric ureteroscopy, and we did it with a very specific, uh, specialized center in Spain. And we obtained very good, uh, uh, achieved very good outcomes comparing it with our outcomes. And similarly, we have uh, collaborated with other nine European center, and we built the first machine learning predict predictive tool to predict the risk of urosepsis after ureteroscopy. Of course, collaboration can get uh, some awards sometimes. And this is an example of what we got in 2017 as the best paper of literature in uh, EAU and also a clinical research award in uh, 2019. This was a good opportunity to show our collaborative work with other centers. And also locally in the last virtual British Association of Urology meeting uh, from a collaborative um, paper, we've actually got the first and the urology best uh, paper. Similar example of collaboration can be found, for example, with the Clinical Research Office of Endourology Society. And they've done a lot of work with multicentric studies in the previous year in all field of endourology. And we want to follow their examples. Oh, and what's the, the, the um, most important point to focus on when we discuss about collaboration is mainly that the data, when they are shared and they are collected by different centers, are not biased by one single center. And also, this can give a better idea of a view across the world, as you've seen. I have a, I had the opportunity to join an international and European um, group, which was a, a great opportunity to share networking and ideas with other colleagues. And this is the YAO and the urology urolytisis group, which is the young section of EAU. And in this, uh, we have a daily or monthly uh, updates on our on our. Uh, collaborative studies, multi-century studies, or surveys, and I have been honored to become the chairwoman of this group and the urology and urolytisis group since 2020, together with other 11 uh, colleagues of um, global uh, nationalists worldwide, and two, two of them are actually in this webinar. And from this collaboration, many papers uh, came out, some discussing about kidney stone treatment, but also about uh, trends of usage of flexible ureteroscopes and ureteroscopy trends with, among urologists worldwide. And uh, at the end of my talk, I hope that could help um, for who wants to start collaboration and because it's a world of collaboration. So everybody needs to be welcome. And I am very happy to collaborate with you if you um, want to share. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amelia. That was an excellent uh, presentation. I'd like to now invite uh, Arjun Nambia. Arjun Ramyar is a reconstructive urologist at the Freeman Hospital. He's also part of the European Association of uh, Urology uh, Methodology Committee. So he'll be speaking on how to publish a high quality systematic review. 
thank you arjun hello everyone my name is arjun nambiar i'm a urologist at freeman hospital at new in newcastle in the uk and also a member of the european association of urology guidelines methods committee and today i'm going to talk to you about how to perform a high quality systematic review now this is a topic that we run a two day course on twice a year uh, with the eau and more than that it's something that you gather experience over the course of of your career just like most other things in medicine and the more you do it the better you get at it but i think there are a few important points that we can talk about today which will help you when you're thinking about planning your review and coming to writing it as well now the easiest thing would probably be to give you three references and say go away and read these and these will guide you towards how doing a good review and that's true to a large extent but there's much more to writing a review than that and a lot of it comes with practical experience and it's some of those tips that I'd like to share with you, with you today but having said that I will give you three references to go away and to read in your own time because they are the most important three publications to read if you are thinking about doing a systematic review the first is amstar 2 which is a checklist that is used for evaluating high quality reviews or systematic reviews but it follows that if you look through the items of the checklist before you start writing your review that will help you plan your review in such a way that all these items uh, are born in mind and thought about when you're doing your your review as a whole so that's the reference for amstar 2 the prisma statement is again a guideline for reporting systematic reviews which is very well documented and widely used and something that everyone who writes systematic reviews should be aware of um a lot of the items in prisma and amstar obviously overlap and therefore can be used in conjunction uh but taken together they certainly provide a wealth of information on how to write good quality reviews the third is the cochran handbook for systematic reviews now this is a vast handbook which goes through extreme detail about every aspect of conducting systematic reviews and is not something that i would recommend reading cover to cover but certainly is something that you can dip into whenever you have any questions uh, and most of the answers will be available in this book the one aspect that i would like to bring to your attention here is the word interventions that has come up twice in this slide and that's an important aspect to bear in mind because most systematic reviews are conducted for interventional studies but that's not always necessarily the case and one thing that i would always recommend people think about strongly at the planning stage is what type of systematic review is it that you're actually doing is it a review of interventions or is it a review of prognostic factors or even a diagnostic test accuracy review and the methods will vary quite significantly depending on the answer to that question so first and foremost decide which type of systematic review you're doing so let's talk of, about a few specific points here first of all what a, what a systematic review is and what it isn't a systematic review is a review of the best evidence available on a particular medical topic it isn't just a quick way to get a publication and it isn't necessarily the best available evidence on a specific topic although it reviews the best literature and although the old hierarchy of evidence states that a systematic review is the highest level of evidence that's not necessarily always the case there are reviews which are done badly and a badly done review is certainly not high quality evidence So that's something that's very important to bear in mind. Depending on the question that you're asking, yes a, a systematic review may give you the answer that you're looking for, but equally it might not. The other thing is study designs. We've already mentioned this briefly and the types of study design that you're going to include in your review will greatly influence the methods that you use. Are they interventional studies? If they're interventional studies, are they randomized studies or non-randomized studies? Or are they simply observational studies or is it a different type of re review altogether we've already spoken about prognostic factors and diagnostic tests which are assessed very differently so the types of study design that are included in your review 
is something that needs to be established at the outset and documented in the protocol. The next thing is when and what to meta-analyze. Meta-analysis is not the be-all and end-all. And meta-analysis is the one aspect of systematic reviews that can be done very badly, even by good reviewers. So it's something to be careful uh, if you do decide to undertake one. Meta-analysis, the best meta-analysis, I would say, is a meta-analysis where you have a number of studies, and it, the number can vary, the, number, the total number is not important, but a number of studies which overall are generally slightly underpowered or haven't quite hit their power calculation. So if you have a number of studies which look at exactly the same outcome, measured exactly the same way, at approximately exactly the same time frame, but they don't quite reach statistical significance. So they trend towards significance, but they don't quite reach significance because they haven't quite reached the numbers required to attain significance. So you have a p-value, for example, in studies which are hovering around 0 0.07, 0 0.1, or somewhere around that range. And you have a number of those studies if you combine all of them together, and if they are otherwise well-conducted studies with a low risk of bias, then when you put them together, there is a good chance that the overall result will achieve statistical significance. And those are the best kind of studies to meta-analyze. Putting studies together which measures, measure the similar outcomes but slightly differently or at different time frames, or they've been measured in different ways using different tools, then you have to be very careful when you're met, when you're putting them together in a meta-analysis because this this the the likelihood of significant heterogeneity would be high. The other thing is understanding bias. Now, the most important aspect probably of doing a systematic review is undertaking a comprehensive risk of bias assessment. That's a topic we could talk about for two or three hours or more, and we do that in our systematic review course. But risk of bias assessment is an extremely important step when conducting a systematic review, because if you are not confident in the estimates of effect because of bias, then it undermines the entire review. The other thing is being a skeptic. Now, a lot of people, especially when you look at Cochrane reviews, complain about the fact that Cochrane reviews usually always conclude that more evidence is required. And this is by design. This is when you conduct a, a thorough review, because of some of the reasons that we've already talked about, you often find that you can't make strong recommendations or strong um, conclusions with the evidence that you've got simply because there's a lot of bias involved or there's a lot of heterogeneity involved in some of your analyses. And it would be wrong in those situations to make a strong conclusion. And that's why so many reviews, well-conducted reviews, such as Cochrane reviews, come to the conclusion that more evidence is required. And that's because the evidence that we have is either of poor quality or the risk of bias is too high. And it should be the same in your review. If you want to do a high-quality review, unless you are lucky enough to do a review on a topic where you have lots of high-level, high-quality randomized control trials which have been conducted on the subject, you're unlikely to be able to come to any strong conclusions. So just to go through briefly some of the critical domains in the Amstar 2 checklist, which will provide some of the points that you will need for making sure that your review is a high quality review. Now, critical domains in Amstar 2 means that if any of these aspects are not covered in your review, then it drops the quality of the review significantly according to the checklist. And the first of those is that the protocol is registered before commencement of the review. That's important. Making sure you have an adequate literature search. That's important. Making sure that your literature, literature search covers an adequate time frame, and also adequate search terms. Justification for excluding individual studies. That should always be mentioned. Risk of bias we've talked about. Assessing, assessing bias in individual studies appropriately. The appropriateness of meta-analytical methods, whether you do a meta-analysis or not, sometimes it's more appropriate not to do a meta-analysis and leave it out completely. And not having a meta-analysis does not mean that it's not a good systematic review. Consideration of risk of bias when you're interpreting the results of the review, that's another important aspect. Assessment of presence and likely impact of publication bias. 
this is something that not a lot of people have a lot of experience with, but it's something that is not very difficult to do once you get your head around it. So again, something that I would advise looking into and making sure that you include in your review. So what is it that makes a high quality systematic review? Well, in summary, I think basically it boils down to these few things, a focused and clinically relevant question for your review, a comprehensive literature search carried out, careful data extraction done in duplicate by at least two reviewers, a considered risk of bias assessment, which is, thor which is thoroughly conducted, appropriate statistical analysis, and an accurate and concise write-up. So I know that's been a very quick whistle-stop tour of how to do a good, lit uh, a good systematic review, and I'd be happy to take any questions. But at the end... Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I think, Arjun, uh, you're on the call. That was fantastic. And uh, thank you for sharing the the know-how what Amster uh, and the checklists that people have to do to make sure the, the systematic review uh, fulfills the criteria. Otherwise, it is less likely to be accepted or taken seriously. Now we will open uh, the, the discussion, uh, which will be led by uh, Dr. Bhavan Rai and Dr. Arabin Panda. So what we're going to do now is uh, we've got uh, faculty members here. We will do critical review of a couple of papers. So Dr. Arbin Panda will present or share some of the critical points and maybe grill the rest of the panel, including myself. And once he has done that, uh, same thing with, with, with Bhavan, where he'll present and then uh, or get opinions on what people feel. And, and the beauty about publishing is uh, not everybody will have... Uh, the same mindset, and I'll give you an example. If you have a junior trainee who has come for two or three months, you cannot expect them to do a high quality, uh, you know, a randomized trial or whatever, because uh, it's a short time. So they will probably be able to do a good case report or the short case series or something like that. Whereas if somebody's doing a PhD, it's different. You know, they will be able to set up. So it is horses for courses. So without further ado, I will uh, pass it on to Arbind. Arbind, thank you very much. Over to you. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just like to uh, quickly show a paper. This was written by us. Uh, and uh, this was an RCT. This is a monopolar versus uh, bipolar transurethral resection of bladder tumors. Uh, it was a single center parallel arm RCT. And uh, what we did was, if you look at the, if you if you really look at the con the consort diagram, uh, I will I, I can I can have slides on what is that. So we had a total of two hundred fifty seven uh, transurethral resections, and uh, the, all of which we are restaging fifty seven and and fifth and thirty refused uh, consent for for the only one seventy were eligible, and we used. Uh, Spinal anesthesia for everything for all the all the patients. So, many were unfit, so they were removed, and, and only 147 could, could, could be randomized. Now, uh, this was so uh, we we did calculate sample size using 80 percent power and 95 percent significance level for operator jerk, and we assumed that uh, our primary our aim of this paper was to prove that uh, it is superior that bipolar TRBT is superior or not superior to monopolar TRBT with respect to operator jerk perforation and hemostasis. This was the aim of the study, with which was 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 the question with which we uh, planned the study, and uh, for that we our design was that. Uh, we had all, all the consecutive patients who have uh, undergoing to RBT, we, we sort of divided them, as I said, and we sort of randomized them based on the sample size and power calculation. 75 were in the monopolar group and 72 were in the bipolar group. And uh, our outcome was incidence of operator jerk uh, between the two arms. And we, we did note that. And also we noted the other things like if there were cautery artifacts and except for the primary investigator who was not blinded, both, this, both the pathologist and the statistician, were, both of them were, were actually blinded to the study. And uh, while cautery artifact was not a primary, uh, was not a, uh, we, we did not use it as a primary question. It was a, it, it was a secondary analysis, but it was a secondary outcome. 
And uh, what we got was that uh, there were some degree of protocol violations, N is equal to six in both arms, and we did a per protocol analysis. And in the end, we concluded that bipolar TRBT was not superior to monopolar TRBT with respect to operator jerk, perforation, and hemostasis. Uh, this, is, this is the paper, and I would just like to ask uh, the, uh, the panel, could we have done this any better? Shall we start with Arjun because he's yeah. the methodologist. Arjun, uh, over to you. Could we have done this any better? Well, I suppose that the, the question that comes to my mind is um, who are the people who are most likely to cause injury during TURBT? And they're generally speaking the less experienced trainees, if you like. So the difference between monopolar versus bipolar, yes. I mean, that, that's a question, that's the main question that we're trying to ask. But within that, the subgroup, if we were able to do a sub-analysis to see with, with less experienced uh, receptors, is there a difference? So does bipolar actually give you an added advantage with, when you're less experienced? With very experienced receptors, good, you know, good endoscopists uh, who've done lots of TURBTs, they know the tricks, they know the methods, they know how to reduce the risk of, of obturated jerk even with, even with monopolar resection, whereas less experienced um, resectors may not. So within that group of people, is there a difference? And that would suggest that yes, the technology helps less experienced people do the procedure more safely. So that might have been, uh, that's just something that I, that I thought of, which might have been an interesting um, analysis to do. So, so Arvind, the surgeon experience looked at. Yeah, no, the, actually uh, it was not possible for us to, because we, we removed bias in the sense, uh, we, we, were, we, are, we were primarily, we are primarily we're teaching hospital where, you know, we uh, were all, all the types of surgeons, you know, from the, from the most experienced to the least experienced we're doing. So in that way, we it, it sort of you know if we could remove the bias because it was sort of randomized from the, the RCT. So we, we hoped it would remove the bias. We did not have enough numbers to you know subgroup. You know we have to do subgroup analysis about certain experience alone. That's absolutely Bhavan? one of the one of the important drawbacks. Something to improve on. Yeah, yeah, Bhavan. Bhavan, you've got a question. Bhavan, I'd like to ask you a question now. I am looking at your paper as a systematic reviewer, and I'd like to ask Jun, uh, Baskar, Amelia. And, every, and Paddy to come into this. Now, when we do a risk of bias analysis, what we will do is, how is your outcomes blinded? Who is measuring your outcome? So is the, uh, that, that's one thing. Now, this is a surgical trial, and this is a problem with surgical trials when, when we do performance bias. So you're never ever going to you know, uh, blind the surgeon or the participant Obviously, the surgeon knows what he's doing and participant because of ethical reasons. Uh, can I get you to comment on that? <laughs> That's okay. Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, it is impossible to blind the surgeon. That's what I wrote in the paper. It's impossible to blind the surgeon because of uh, obvious issues. Uh, we just tried to blind the pathologist and the statistician. Yeah, that was the only thing that we could do. And if you look at the literature, you know, I, I just I have a few slides after this. I can just go through this. If you if you if you look at the literature, they, because we had also protocol violations in that which I've mentioned, and uh, we had per protocol analysis. Perhaps intention to have been preferable, and we have fewer females. If you read the full paper, you know that we have fewer females in this in this study. So this is uh, if you look at that. If you if you actually if you look at one second, I'll just go back to this. So one of the one of the problems with the uh, with the with the, there's only six to ten percent of the urologic literature are RCTs for the same reason. And uh, if you are going to look at surgical, uh, if, if you are looking at uh, a, a surgeon doing it, we can't blind the surgeon, and and we can't blind the patient. At the most, we can on table we can you know we can uh, randomize with the block randomization and then proceed. Okay. You know one can of I the interesting. Sorry, Bob, please go on. Can I just ca carry on from there? Now, this is an issue when we do systematic reviews. And I'd like Arjun to comment on this, if that's okay. Because eventually, when we report uh, risk of bias outcomes, we will always put a red mark uh, when we assess surgical trials. And that will eventually feed on to the grade evaluation in terms. So do you really think RCTs are designed 
to assess surgical trials. And sometimes the messages that we send out in systematic reviews, where we say the quality of evidence is low, uh, may sometimes be misleading because there are certain domains we can't really correct for. Arjun? Yeah, no, you're right. Um, surgical trials are always going to suffer slightly in that regard, but I think it, it boils down to interpretation. The question is, have the trialists done everything possible to minimize the risk of that performance bias? So particularly in this sort of scenario, it largely depends on the outcome. So if it's possible that the outcome can be assessed independently by somebody who is not part of the surgical team, that will make a difference and that will drop the risk of bias. If, so for example, obturator jerk, if you're, if you're asking the surgeon whether there's an obturator jerk, they, you know, they might give you a slightly wishy-washy answer, okay, maybe a little bit of a, a movement was not a jerk, but if you've got somebody who is, you know, knows what an obturator jerk is meant to be and what it looks like, but is there independently and doesn't know what type of um, monopolar versus bipolar you're using, and they're in theater and assessing whether this person has had it versus this person hasn't, it's about whether, the, whether you've minimized the risk one thing I, 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 I'd like to say, I like Chris Harding's one line that he said, there is never going to be a perfect paper. You exactly, know? yeah. Uh, having said that, don't forget, it is doing an RCT in surgical setup. There are so many issues regarding ethics, funding, uh, and lots of these things. And there's always a worry. So actually, uh, Arvind, oh, kudos to you, because a negative trial sometimes... It's so hard to present and to ha still have that and to publish. But I mean, do you think, and actually I'd like to get Aditya's comment as well. Aditya, you've, you've looked at, do you think if the number of patients could have been in theory, let's say we had 1,000 patients. Now it's almost impossible. But could the, because why is, is it that for TURPs, bipolar shows a clear advantage in trials, in 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 reviews, but not in TRBTs. Yeah, I, what do you think? I, I like to answer you that. First, the, yeah, the, yeah, there, are, there are two parts to your question. One is, if an increased sample size, could we have uh, got uh, got a got a positive result? Or um, uh, if you if you look at the data and with the analysis, with the small sample size, which was quite representative, except for the fact that we didn't have females in our females in the group, there was really not much of a difference. It is actually very and and when you look at something like what is clinically significant and what is statistically significant, they're two different things. With a larger sample size, it's possibly that we may have achieved something like say, a, a statistical significance, but how, how relevant that would have been clinically uh, remains, um, uh, remains the moot point. About the second point, I'd just like to raise a question about the, the RCTs. We, but I feel that RCTs are very overrated in, in certain aspects. Uh, because it, the, the type of trial that we are going to do is dependent on the scientific questions uh, we are going, we, we want to answer. And what is our primary objective? Sometimes an RCT fits in and sometimes other, other types of, uh, of studies do fit in to answer that question. In, in surgical, in, in pure surgical management, sometimes RCTs, it's difficult to do and it doesn't always, you know, uh, fit into the, into the, into the, uh, old, into the overall picture. Yeah. So, uh, Aditya, any comments yes, from you? So, uh, sir, interestingly, we did a systematic review on this topic, uh, versus bipolar QRBT. And uh, our primary objective was to look at the uh, obturator jerk. And uh, secondary objectives were uh, that we looked at uh, blood loss uh, during the procedure and uh, the uh, artifact, the pathological artifact on histopathology, which are its more. And interestingly, we found that although there was a difference in hemoglobin fall in between the bipolar and monopolar, and as Arvind sir said, that there's a difference between a statistical significance versus a clinically significant relevant thing. So the same thing the reviewer asked me that, do you think it's this statistical fall of one, uh, I think it was 0.7 uh, gram per deciliter HB is making a difference. Then we had to modify it that, that the clinically relevant uh, uh, thing would be a blood transfusion which will be a, uh, relevant for me as a clinician rather than a statistical jargon of uh, getting a HB fall. So, so the, interestingly, that was what we found. And as you said, uh, Arjun has uh, wonderfully highlighted that 
these are the uh, studies and these are the rcts which should be targeted to conduct systematic review to give us a meaningful result whether monopolar is better or a bipolar is better although in our personal experience we are having more operator jerk with our bipolar with donum which is uh, one particular company but still uh, the number of uh, studies which were able to encompass in the systematic review and meta analysis gave us a result much better than the rct and definitely blinding will definitely be remain a problem and majority of the studies which were included had a problem with blinding and uh, and some of them with the allocation concealment at that point just one more point i'd like like to make one is when we look at rcts in in in, in surgical trials there has to be reason for performing an rct is there a genuine you know in a genuine uncertainty is there, like what we say sort of sort of principle of uh, of clinical equipo is there a genuine uncertainty is there a question in which you're unsure about and you want the answers uh that is most important and then it it is then it becomes ethical actually to perform an rct on that on that particular question and uh, second point is uh, of course uh, uh this uh, and when you are planning an rct and we need to look at the something called internal and external external validity rcts often have excellent internal validity because we take a very specific population and then we subject them to a experimental study but when we try to extrapolate these results to the general population it may not be uh, may not hold water it may not be valid for them we have a lot of uh, of trials for of for bph on the same thing and where where the two whether they really chose a very uh, very specific subset of population uh, with with larger prostates and then they concluded that if we do give them combination therapy they do 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 benefit so again rcts require money rcts require uh, you know to have a complete setup with this with, the, with the, your research assistants with your statisticians and it, it and it requires time which is not always possible yes can i so can, th- that is wonderful but look i mean you have achieved it and that shows that it can be possible paddy i want to ask you you are now involved in norway so paddy trained in uk and now you are there system probably slightly different you are involved in a trial what are the issues you're getting with the laser trials that you are doing there is it similar and and you know how is it going so i'm not part of that trial but uh here in uh so i can't speak directly from that but as you say they are running a randomized control trial on tuli laser and uh i think a credit to professor panda because to the reality of trying to conduct a randomized trial alongside your clinical work and how to disseminate that you could create a whole session seminar just on that because i am so impressed by how they do it and there must be and i'm trying to watch and learn experiences of how you make it as simple as possible for everyone uh so here they're very good and they have it laid out in terms of settings and they've had uh the sessions to explain to how it works and that's everyone from you know the surgeons who are doing it us including residents as, as well they're doing it residents but also explaining it to the fit staff as well everyone is really key to it so i think you know i'm afraid i can't really answer it cuz i'm not part of that study but watching uh, professor alder here i'm really impressed with how he's managed to make it sort of like compact and understandable so that everyone can understand it because it's such a team effort for the whole hospital to be involved with you know if that helps and i think and i think that is the key because these rcts i mean okay systematic reviews you need the, the methodology and you need but the rcts and i think collaborative studies amelia i'm just like digressing slightly you have done a few collaborative studies now and yes. i know you're very well you're very well liked as an endurologist but people like us who may not be as liked as you what is the trick to convince and get people on board with the collaborative studies how do you do it uh, it's very difficult it's a very hard work <laughs> but um essentially it's just to make, make sure you choose the the right people first because um of course people that have experience that have the data case volume so a big center and then people that have already experience in publication and uh, to publish their data and then i i just normally um, set up a meeting or a email with everybody just to 
just to explain what is the aim of the project, to send the protocol, show it to everybody and see if realistically everybody can join or not. So if they uh, think they can um, answer our expectation, then we're gonna, of course, enroll the, the center into the study. But there are a lot of issues of um, patient confidentiality and every country had different rules for that. For example, we've had a lot of um, um, controversies with Belgium where uh, patients cannot be, patient data cannot be released at all, not even anonymized. And for, for that, with them, it's very difficult to do, uh, to include them in our multicentric studies. So um, we need to consider many things, but once the team is consolidated, then, and there are all people who are committing, and then it's just a matter of doing some reminders um, from now and then, just to make sure they, they are um, on the job, let's say. And also discuss frequently, just to make sure that all the doubts will be uh, clarified between us. Make sure everybody is on the same page. Bowen, over yeah. to you. And Bowen, there are two other questions, if you can answer them from the chat box from the viewers and for your uh, case, for your paper. Do you want me to start my presentation, Bhaskar? Or if you want to take the questions first, I don't mind, however you want to do it. So there's two questions. The first one is how to over overcome plagiarism while writing research papers. Uh, I think the best way to avoid plagiarism is to basically not provide original work. Uh, remember, this is your work. This is what you've done. You don't really have to rely on anybody else's work to publish your article. Uh, but there are certain sentences that you will often use. These are common sentences that are used in medical practice. So there are plagiarism check softwares that you can use. I'd also like to highlight something called self-plagiarism. If you've published an article and you've written the article, you can't quote yourself. This is not your property anymore. It's the property of the uh, journal. So just be careful. Just because you've written something, that does not mean that uh, uh, you can quote it again. Uh, as a reader, one of the ways that you often identify potential plagiarism is when you do not see a direct connection between the sentences there's a real mismatch, there's no continuity. So often look into the references that they've quoted and see if there is any match there. So these are some of the things that I've learned over a period of time, but I can't emphasize enough that no paper is worth ruining your reputation. So I, I, it is really important. Mm -hmm. This is your original work and you don't really have to rely on anybody else to publish good work. Okay, that, one, that's one Please that well. yeah. I think uh, obviously when you're writing scientific papers, it's it's inevitable that you have to reference other people's work. So that's 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 the nature of, of scientific writing. But the, the things to remember are paraphrase and interpret. So don't write ex copy and paste exactly what is from in another paper. You read it, you interpret it, and you write it in your own words. What these software check for are repetitions of chunks of work from other papers. If it's exactly the same, if a paragraph is exactly the same, it'll get picked up in plagiarism checks. Whereas if you've put your own spin on it, your own interpretation on it, and written it in your own words, in your own language, it, it shouldn't come up in those checks. And then obviously reference it appropriately as well. So that that's the main thing. Yes, you have to quote other people's work, but do it in such a way that it's through your own interpretation rather than just copying it from another paper and putting it in your own. Good point. Yeah, Dr. Panda, you are on mute if you want to unmute yourself. I just like to make one point. Uh, a lot of plagiarism can be avoided if the authors actually knew what exactly plagiarism meant. As, as Bhavan just said about self-plagiarism, uh, there are two forms. One, they don't really know whether that's, that's illegal. Second, some people do went on salami slicing. Actually, they try to split a particular work into, into multiple words. But as, as Arjun just said, uh, Paraphrasing has to be avoided and it is best to write the entire thing in your own words rather than you know, just put the words uh, mix and match and put the words together in another sentence. Even that is going to be picked up by the plagiarism software. 
And and in sometimes in the Eastern, in particularly I can say in India and in the East, sometimes it is mark of deep respect to sort of court, you know, court somebody. But in the West, which is going to be caught as uh, you know as uh, as as cheating. So if it is possible for for journal editors and uh, you know to sort of educate them that this is plagiarism and not acceptable, I think 50, 60 percent, which is unintentional. I mean, about 40, 50 percent of, of if you look at plagiarism is actually intentional and people are doing it on, on purpose or they're too lazy. But about 50 to 60 percent is actually unintentional and that will stop. And we need to actually separate unintentional from intentional plagiarism. I think that's quite important. Good, good point. Pawan, over to you for your, uh, for your uh, paper. Bhavan, you're on mute. Can you, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to talk about a Cochrane review that I published where we compared open and robotic cystectomy. Now, Cochrane review is often a template that most systematic reviews follow. And I'll just go through some uh, points that Arjun uh, discussed earlier, but we will give it some application with this systematic review. So often uh, any form of systematic review has certain domains that we have to follow. There's a protocol. Cochrane reviews have their own uh, uh, platform where you can pub publish the protocol. And remember this protocol needs to be extensively discussed. But for people who don't, uh, who are doing independent systematic reviews, there are uh, forums such as Prospero that you can use. Within this, we decided on a protocol. We decided on mainly oncological and major complications as a outcome measures. There's a systematic, uh, there was a search strategy. So remember, there are ways of doing a search strategy. But if you have uh, strong organizations, there's also information scientists who can help you with this. Alternatively, you can also speak to your own librarian uh, to help you with this search strategy. Within this, we had five studies. And uh, the thing that I'd like to emphasize uh, importantly in systematic reviews, and this is mistakes that I've made, and uh, this, you know, and uh, it's something that we've also learned over a period of time. Every systematic review is not a is not tantamount with the meta-analysis. You don't have to have a meta-analysis. In fact, the quality of certain systematic reviews are better off without a meta-analysis. And especially when you have two groups of uh, patients that you're comparing that are not balanced. And this is often seen in non-RCTs. So the reason why we often say that randomized control trials should be analyzed is that you assume because they go through a uh, uh, bias process that uh, the likelihood of imbalance between the two cohorts uh, is not very high. The next, the final thing you do is you do a quality uh, assessment. And this you do in two elements of it. One is a risk of bias of individual studies, and there are a number of domains. I'll take you through the next slides and you'll know what it is. But you also do uh, you also have to be sure if you're confident about the evidence and you do something called grade evaluation. So for example, within this uh, re systematic review, we were looking at time to occurrence. So apart from a risk of bias of the individual studies that were included in the systematic review, how certain are we of time to recurrence analysis that we've done? So that's called a grade evaluation. So I'll just take you through two uh, outcome measures. Once there's recurrence-free survival, we concluded that the recurrence-free survival was similar. But if you look at the risk of bias, which is on the right-hand side here, I've got my cursor there. It, the green means that there's low risk of bias. The yellow means that you're not certain. And the red means that there's a high risk of bias. And this is often in surgical trials, there is a high risk of bias. And that is a question I'd asked Arvind earlier on. And this, as a reader, you must see this with a degree of caution, just because there's a high risk of bias, doesn't always necessarily mean that these are bad studies. Similarly, for major complication rates, you can again see a number of rates, usually around bias with surgical trials. So when the risk of bias, there are a number of ways Cochrane has its own way of doing it. And this is what we, we would recommend that you use. 
it usually uses a selection bias, performance bias. Remember, uh, particularly for performance and detection bias, you can use your individual outcomes. You don't have to do a risk of bias for the entire paper. You can do it for individual elements. So for example, uh, outcome measures, quality of life. Now, if the patient knows what procedure he's had, the detection bias is likely to be high. Whereas for positive margin rates, the pathologist will not know what procedure the patient's had. So the risk of bias may be low. So you can do sub-analysis within that as well. The final thing is a grade evaluation. This is of the outcome measures. So this is the second element where we, for individual outcomes, for example, positive margin rates, was the risk of bias high? It may have been low. But for uh, quality of life measures, the risk of bias may be high because the patient knows what procedure he's had done. Imprecision, this is often, is there huge, uh, is the confidence intervals quite wide? So whilst you get a pooled analysis, you get a final result, you're not quite sure because the variation in results are quite high. Indirectness is, have they got this uh, outcome uh, because they're correlating it with another uh, measure. Inconsistency often means heterogeneity, i.e. there is differences between individual studies for individual outcomes and is there publication bias. And based on this, you eventually conclude that your outcomes are of low, moderate or high certainty. And for this uh, uh, Cochrane review, what we said was that for most outcome measures, the, our uh, confidence or certainty was low, but for minor complications, it was very low. And for transfusion rates, it was moderate. Uh, and what this essentially means in a layman's term is that when it's low, there may be reasonable potential that these outcomes may not be true. So that's what we did. I'll uh, take it to the panel to see if there are any questions you'd like to ask. Bhavan, uh, I'll start. I think this was one of the best uh, Cochrane reviews in bladder cancer in the recent times. One thing I want to ask for the viewers, and I have done it myself, and most of the people here have done systematic reviews. How much time did it take you to learn to do a good systematic review? If somebody has to start, and you know, the experience will be different, and I have, have known you a long time, but what would he say to learn it, not just methodology, to learn it and to do it? And I'm not talking about to do it at the best possible way because that is something beyond. But how much time does an average Joe Blocks need to do it well? The first thing I'll say is I'm still learning. I, uh, you know, <laughs> and uh, uh, I think any form of research project, including systematic reviews, is teamwork. Uh, there are many elements to any paper that you write. And the reason why I say it's teamwork is that there's always going to be a section within an individual research project that you are good at. You will probably have overall understanding and reasonable understanding, but there are elements that you understand or have an interest in. And I'd like to give our example. So Baska, myself, Amelia, Paddy, Arjun, we, we've, we've published a number of projects together. But within that group, we have the ideas man, which is usually Baska. We, we have the guy who understands the methodology quite well, which is usually Paddy and Arjun. And we have the guy who's good at statistics, which is usually Rob. I like writing, it's my strength. Uh, so all of us have individual elements that we bring onto the table. So the first thing I would say is that this is not something that you can do on one, your own. In fact, I would discourage that you do it on your own. You have to find a team uh, and Within that team, you have to have people with varying degrees of experiences. So, so, and everybody has a role to play. For someone to start, I think it takes a couple of years, is my personal view, to do a reasonable quality systematic review. And the reason I say this, and I've learned from my mistakes, some of the reviews that I've done in the past, I don't think we're always very good. And this is something that you've learned over a period of time. Systematic reviews advise people it can send a very wrong message if interpreted erroneously. So it's important that you, you have a degree of training. And like Arjun says, you know, there are uh, initiatives within the EAU that people can use. It is 
it is uh, you know it's a fantastic course there's so much you can learn from it so that is what i would say i i can't give a straightforward answer because i think it, re- it really I, depends on your dynamics i i completely agree bhavan i think it does take it is not a question of a few weeks you know you can't just go and learn it on a course but that definitely gives you a solid grounding and you know on that note can i put you on spot now this course that we have talked about there might be a lot of listeners who might want to think is it invited can people participate join in how does it work or is it something that and i'm not going to quote you on that and none of us will but do eau or panels like that should make it more widely uh, you know make it a course which is shared widely yeah that, that that's something we have been talking about i mean i think initially where with this started probably about 3 or 4 years ago and initially it was very much geared towards existing panel members and existing guidelines associates and people who wanted to be and then following that people who wanted to become guidelines associates but now we've come to a point where we're probably at a stage where we don't need to uh develop that many new associates that regularly so we are opening it up to to the, to a wider audience as well and it it, it is still it is still by invitation but you can certainly um get in touch and express an interest to join and uh, you know when spaces are available then then we can we can issue those spaces spaces out to non uh, panel panelists and associates as well so that's definitely something that that will open up in the next one or two years once we get back to face to face meetings that that's great thanks thanks sajun aditya you have done a few reviews uh bhavan has just presented something uh i just want a few lines what do you think and i just i want both neg- positive and negative bear in mind uh, uh first of all i would like to congratulate the entire team for getting a cochrane review we know that it's a very long and arduous process i've been in touch with clinical pharmacologists at our place and they are the best persons whom you can have a statistical discussion regarding a systematic review uh i think it must have taken a very long time for him to publish a systematic in a cochrane review actually um when we started doing a systematic review uh, we identified as dr bhavan has said we identified one person each de- who can be designated for a particular uh, task right from starting from the search strategies you need to learn it from a librarian first of all so in india again you need to find dedicated courses there were no dedicated courses when we started doing systematic review here itself so at our center we learned from one of our seniors who used to do certain systematic reviews but from the field of medicine that's why i told in my uh, presentation also innovations and new things will start at the boundary of uh, sub specialties so that's how we started and there is no shortcut to a systematic review or for a good systematic review uh um, you need to start slow first and foremost is to identify a topic which is worth doing a systematic review it's it's uh, so minute and then you begin from there at the search strategy and you and the uh, intriguing part is not learning the using a revman or using a mendley or a end note you can learn that but uh, just putting entire team together for that particular topic for that particular task is is a humongous task itself so so it's, definitely definitely it's the team work which which will uh, get you through it's like way. it's like saying you can have all the ingredients of the pot puri or chaat but you need to yes. make it to make it yes. better exactly can i ask you arbin you are one of the editors now how do you distinguish between a good and a bad systematic review how do you to what extent do you go to to see because how do you know it's not being done similar thing Uh, there are two things here uh, i would like to first i would like to congratulate on a very nice corporate review we've done one uh, as as aditya said with the and uh, with with the with the pgi faculty and it was very, it was very difficult in the sense it took 4 5 years one of the issues with that with with, uh, with the corporate review is by the time you get to the publication stage some of your old references have become dated and you have to go through them again and they will insist that you go through them again uh, or they would not get published and uh, the second thing about choosing a good review is first thing to see is what is the question you have taken uh, if the, the scientific question is the main thing and then uh, there are certain questions uh, which have a lot of literature and which has to be sieved well and uh, there are two types again you have a descriptive review and you have a proper systematic review as of now journals are not really going for the descriptive ones it's going to be very difficult for you to get a, get a, get a publication if you just write a sort of a descriptive or, or sort of a narrative review so 
a good question and you have checked the literature well and then you have your um, uh, rigorous methodology i think that's what they're looking for but most importantly before you do to take on this arduous task it would be a good idea to drop a letter to the editor and uh, make sure that he he sort of invites you or he says okay we need this review on this particular topic and you are quite welcome to do it so it, it sort of becomes invited then it stands a much better chance of publication or they might finally say that see we already have published a review on this topic a few days back or there was a review on this topic in another journal a few months back and we don't want it and that would be a waste of time because a lot of effort has really gone into it okay well, can i there is a question in the, the by the audience and i want paddy and amelia to try and uh, give their views on it so the question is i'm one of the basic researchers in clinical field my supervisor never helps me to improve my skills oops okay so so what can i do to improve some of these skills so you have both paddy and amelia come from not doing a lot to suddenly exploding on the field of research and doing a lot so what 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 was your uh, mantra so can i start with paddy first and then amelia so, so if, if i'm right, right the question is when you work somewhere where you're not being supported is that yeah so if if you're not getting immediate support how do you what support how do you go about getting that support mm. So firstly, I feel their, their struggle, and it's a very real one. Uh, and I come back to the last thing I said is that firstly, you can't give up, even if you feel like that's what you want to do. In terms of, uh, and coming back to the first presentation by Professor Panda, he mentioned having a mentor. So with time, that can come. And I know, for example, with yourself, that it is possible to get in touch with people who don't work where you work exactly. Uh, in the same physical place. And, you know, I'm not saying that they're going to give you their data, but you may be able to write a review together. And I would say that a lot of these people, like, you can help them uh, insofar as if you're keen and you have time, then... Uh, and most people will give you, I'd say, one chance. And if you take that chance, especially if you meet them uh, at a conference or a meeting and you're honest and you're genuine, then uh, people will give you a chance. Another thing is, as has been touched on, is about having uh, collaboratives. And I know, for example, in the UK, the BURST is an excellent one, particularly if you're getting the ball rolling, or maybe you work in a small district general hospital, you can still give uh, data to it, and then you get involved with things, and then, you know, with time, you come to meet people who you are part of a team, and I think Baskets and Balin, everyone else summarised it very well, in that so it's a bit like a football team, in that you come to see that people have different skills, uh, but together they come to do great things. Uh, and on the sidelines, you do have a mentor, uh, uh, and which is why, uh, you know, if you can find someone to support you, like going to systematic review, then it will really help. Um, I hope that helps in some way. Okay. So basically, just to recap what you've said, if there's no local help, try and distant help, write to people, some will help. Meet people in meetings, try and network and try and collaborate. Amelia, anything else you'd add to what Paddy has said? Yeah, I, I agree with Paddy. I just uh, would would add in case it's difficult to get a basis you now to start from if it's if the, the requirement is properly to have some roots, then a course or webinars like the one of today could give the right uh, base to to build gradually a little brick the time and then also gives the opportunity to network and to meet other people that have the same aim and probably the same level or maybe a little bit of higher level that can give the right suggestions or advices and also read other works of, of people who've already done it so trying to um, have a culture and a background of what's already been done to know what to start from yourself and it's been touched on the slides before, and that is, with time, you can come to work somewhere, because there are some very different environments where you work, in terms of how it's supported. I'm lucky here in that uh, there's an ethos whereby it's really encouraged to do these things. In other places, you know, you may be doing this hard work, but uh, you're sort of really in the darkness when you're doing it, because no one else is. So, with time, if you come to work somewhere, 
where there's an environment. I know Newcastle clearly has it, and Southampton has it, and probably everywhere else for the speakers here. I think that makes a difference too. Uh, it's, it's where you work. So, Richard, if you are hearing this talk, there is hope. Uh, you don't have to rely on one person. You can reach out to other people. Courses, uh, I know you do, do some courses or lots of societies, wherever you are, do courses. So don't lose hope and hopefully you can find the right person, the right people to collaborate with. Bhavan, over to you. Can I just make one one other point on what Bhavan was talking about as well, about uh, please, you know, surgical please, trials please. and uh, reviews and surgical trials. I think that one other thing to bear in mind is that there, there is also scope to be a bit brave. We, we talked earlier about putting your own individual stamp on your, your scientific writing. And within systematic reviews, there is scope for that. And Bhavan is very good at this. And you know, when it comes to risk of bias assessment, it is a judgment call a lot of the time. So if you're a bit brave, you can say, even in a surgical trial, you can say that, look, for this particular outcome, for this particular comparison, even though there is it's performed by different people. And because it's a surgical trial, each, uh, each healthcare giver knows what intervention they're giving. We think that for this outcome, that doesn't affect the outcome that much. And also because the outcomes have been assessed by somebody else, we think the risk of bias is low. And you can make that call and you can give it a low score on risk uh, or give it a, a low risk of bias score, despite being a surgical trial. If you think the effect on the outcome is low, that's your judgment call. You can do that as long as you justify it in the in the in the write up well. Then you can make that call and and stand by it. So you can also be brave and put your own individual stamp on things as well. That's a good point actually, because just because it's a surgical trial, it doesn't always have to be biased for that particular outcome. Yeah. I think uh, we're probably coming to the conclusion of today's program, and it was. This was a very interesting discussion, very intellectually stimulating, uh, even for someone who's intellectually challenged like me. So thank you very much to all our panelists and thank you to all our reviewers. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank Sun Pharma, Medisage, uh, for supporting us today in this program. Uh, we also would like to thank Frontiers. Frontiers is coming up with a special edition on technology. Uh, and anyone who's interested in technology, who's published in technology or who wants to continue and pub uh, publish in technology, please do uh, submit your work to this edition. Uh, and uh, we hope that uh, we, we, can, we can spread the message about your technology. And to all our viewers, once again, thank you very much and hope to see you in the next couple of weeks again. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. It was a real pleasure to be here and an honor. Thank you so much. Thank you, Arbin, Bhavan, Arjun, Aditya, 